So it's with great pleasure, pleasure that I introduce Florence Wilcock. Florence is an obstetrician with 30 years of experience working in NHS maternity services. She has a special interest in improving women's experience of maternity care, working with midwives to support women with personalised birth preferences. Florence is the lead obstetrician for perinatal mental health and has a joint clinic with the perinatal mental health colleagues. She's also the link consultant for the Trust's home birth team and has a joint clinic with our the, with their consultant midwife. Florence is also a member of her local Maternity Voices partnership. She has co-founded Hashtag Matt EXP with Jill Phillips, a grassroots movement of women, families and staff caring for them, working together to improve maternity services. The workshops have been a tremendous success, being used by more than 50 maternity services and still being used today. Florence is also a clinical representative on the RCOG Women's Network and has her own podcast called The Obs Pod. Florence, I don't know if you're able to turn your camera on and we'll turn ours off and then I'll give you presenter role. Hello, can you see me? We can, welcome. Perfect, thank you very, very much for the introduction. I'm just gonna shut my blind because I'm gonna be a bit stripy otherwise. You've got rain, I've got a bit of sun. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, and I'm gonna talk about collaborative working and I'm just gonna give you some ideas, the sorts of things that I do in my day-to-day -day work um, and that the midwives I work with do. And um, I am very happy to be interrupted and ask questions as we go along. If there's something that you want me to expand on, um, just put it in the chat and hopefully Ali and um, Letitia can just uh, draw my attention to it. So a little bit about who I am. So I've been working in obstetrics and gynaecology um, in the NHS in the UK for about 30 years now. And actually, um, when I became a consultant, um, I decided to subspecialize just in obstetrics, which at the time was relatively unusual. But maternity care had always been my absolute passion. Labour ward was where I felt happy. Um, it was my, yeah, my happy place. And I really wanted to focus on that and, and uh, improving maternity care. Along the way, I had two daughters of my own and I had very different birth experiences in terms of experience, but identical birth experiences in terms of clinical outcome. So with both my daughters, I had an emergency cesarean for what people would describe as failure to progress. This made me realize even more than I had before how the language we use, the way we talk to women, the way women experience their birth and the care they're given has a massive impact because although on paper my births were identical, to me they were very, very different. One was a very negative experience and the other a very positive experience. So as Ali mentioned, I've done lots of work on trying to improve women's experience of maternity care. And in lockdown, I decided to start a podcast to try and demystify the role of the obstetrician, make us a bit less scary, a bit more approachable, and to try and let midwives and pregnant women using maternity services kind of understand our thinking and, and a bit about us and what it's like to be us. One thing always leads to another with me and I ended up giving a, a TEDx NHS talk in August of last year which is called Birth Should Be Special about the idea that a birth experience is a woman's unique experience and 
given I work in a high income country, women are often only having maybe two, three children in their lifetime. And those experiences are the profound moment for them when their child is born and that stays with them forever. And that's not to say if you have more children, it's less important, absolutely not. But we need to understand that birth is a pivotal moment in that woman's life. And indeed, I heard some time ago, some recollections of women, um, it was interviews taken in a hospice at the end of life. And one of the key things that women wanted to recount about their lives was their birth experience. So it's important to the day they die. In my job, I'm teaching, training and supporting not only junior doctor colleagues, but also midwives, student midwives. And in their turn, over the course of my career, midwives have taught me an immense amount. I'm sometimes labelled an honorary midwife, and I'm really proud of that title. And so when it was suggested to me, I might like to come and talk at Virtual International Day of the Midwife, I absolutely jumped at the chance. So why am I here? I'm here because I strongly believe in midwifery. So access to a midwife and good midwifery care is crucial to outcomes for mothers and babies. We know the evidence is absolutely abundant. But midwives are only part of the system, as it's sometimes called. A maternity service is composed of all sorts of other health professionals. And it's important that we work together if we're truly going to put a woman at the centre of the care we give. As professionals, how do we make that happen if that midwife is that key contact, that key continuity, hopefully, and key person, then midwives are advocating for women as well as caring for women. And how we interact as obstetricians, anaesthetists, nursing staff, and other health professionals can have an impact on that relationship and support of that relationship. So I'm here to share my ideas and improve collaboration, hopefully um, provide, provide some ideas about respectful, safe, women-centred care wherever in, in the world you are, and hopefully make some connections. It's exciting to see people from across the world. Um, and I'm interested that there's quite a few people um, from the United States because um, that's quite a different sort of maternity care provision. Um, uh, I'm, I'm led to believe. Excuse me? So I'm going to explore four basic things. I'm going to talk about relationships, leadership, information and communication. So before I start, I'm going to talk a little bit in relationships about teamwork. Who do you see as part of your team? I did some work on experience in the operating theatre and I took Jill Phillips, um, who I collaborate with, who's not a medical professional, to look around the operating theatre. And it was really fascinating because the sister in charge of operating theatres very proudly displayed this beautiful display of staff photographs. And when we looked at the photographs, we noticed there were nursing staff and operating department assistants, but there were no anaesthetists and no surgeons. And we asked her, this is the operating theatre, where are the anaesthetists and surgeons? They're not up um, on your board. Surely they're part of your team. And she said, no, they're not part of our team. They're just visitors. So thinking about who actually belongs in your team, who do you see as being in your team is an interesting question because what you might think of as your team might be completely different from what other people think of as your team. So I'd like you to say, if you can, 
um, by taking the poll, which I'm going to give you, who do you think might be part of your team when you're on duty? I'm just giving it a moment. Um, so we've got 15 responses. Let's see if anyone else wants to do it. So when I'm on duty, I definitely feel it's the whole team. So I've been on Labour Ward today and I'm working with my colleagues, anaesthetists, midwives, nurses, midwife in charge, students, um, a whole range of different people, paediatricians. Okay. So I'm going to publish the results. So we've got most people saying that every member of the st of staff on duty, um, they consider to be part of their team, um, which is heartening. Um, we've got a few who feel um, one or two that are just the midwives or just other junior people. And that picture I put up about flattening the hierarchy is really important. How approachable are the other people on duty? Do you feel able to go and talk to other people? So sometimes we work alongside people, but we may not be a genuine team. Do we actually really work together? Professor Michael West has done a lot of work on teamwork and he talks about pseudo teams where people aren't actually working as a team um, and really coming together, understanding each other, having a common purpose, a shared goal and then reviewing things. Um, but they just happen to be people that are working together. It's a bit like when you have toddlers at a playgroup and they're kind of playing but they're playing alongside each other rather than with each other so do we really get to know each other some suggestions and and things that i've participated in um, to try and get to know and understand my colleagues a bit better are um randomized control ra ra rather than a randomized controlled trial a randomized coffee trial so that could be that you put your names in a hat and you pull someone else out that works on your team and you just go and have a coffee together or have lunch together or just meet up and have a chat together it could be that you decide to do that with a specific person that you perhaps work with but occasionally but don't know very much about how do you get to know them as a, another human being, as a person, understanding the whole of them, not just their work or their grade, what's going on for them, what are they interested in, what do they feel is important in their day-to-day -day work. So trying to get to actually know each other. And I've done this both within the maternity unit, but also we've done it across maternity units so an initiative a few years ago was to have a randomized coffee trial of people interested in in matex improving maternity experience across the uk and we matched people up so that actually someone who was working in perhaps devon could talk to someone who was working in scotland for half an hour and now with the advent of um teams and zoom and these virtual platforms it's really easy so you could have a randomized co coffee trial with someone the other side of the world doesn't necessarily have to be someone in your team but getting to know your team and understanding their roles another way of um, looking at people's roles and understanding what they really do is shadowing so our admin team are really critical in improving continuity of care and making sure a woman sees the same midwife throughout her pregnancy um, and hopefully also being looked after by that same team in labour. 
So they have a really critical role. But how much do we understand about what they do and how much do they understand about what we do? So one of our admin team who works in the maternity back office and organises all the appointments and sits on reception came to shadow me on labour wards so that she could understand what the final outcome is and what that woman's experience of birth is. And I went and I shadowed her in the office and understood the complexity of how to get the woman an appointment at a time that she could go to that was with the correct midwife in the correct place so that she would get continuity of care and sat on reception to see the sorts of worries women come in with, what appointments might need adjusting, do they need interpreting services um, and all sorts of things that I haven't thought about. One of our consultant obstetricians had one of the home birth midwives come in and shadow her on labour ward because she was very used to looking after uncomplicated births and women labouring physiologically at home but didn't have a lot of experience of women in an obstetric environment. And one of our consultant obstetricians shadowed one of our theatre runners. So we may do a case, do a caesarean perhaps, walk out of theatre, but do we know what the runners are doing to tidy up after us, clean the theatre, sterilise things, make sure the equipment goes back to be re-sterilised, the count correct, the floor mopped, and then all the equipment, where does it all live? Um, and what do we need to do to prepare for the next case? So understanding the crucial role that we each play in the team and how that team comes together and starting to try and get to know the rest of your team a bit helps build understanding. So coming back to roles and responsibilities, I'm a consultant. What does that actually mean? Well, if you go back to the origin of the word consult, the definition is to get information or advice from a person or book, etc., with specialist knowledge on a particular subject. So that doesn't mean I have to do absolutely everything, but it means I can be consulted. So what does this mean in practice? I am the link consultant. So many of the women under my care will never meet me. I don't necessarily need to meet them. I work closely with a number of midwifery teams and we can decide who needs to see me, who can see them and how best to make sure that that woman gets the right care from the right professional within the team. The picture I've put up is actually the perinatal mental health team. So we've got specialist midwives that you can see on the left and myself and then on the right we've got um, psychiatric and psychiatric uh, mental health nursing support. So we will see women in a joint clinic but it might be that they need to see the specialist mental health midwife or it might be they need to see the psychiatrist or they might need to see me and the psychiatrist and we'll have a lot of conversations going on behind the scenes, perhaps emails back and forth or sharing information on our electronic record or they'll come and say to me, this woman does actually need to be seen by you. I'm seeing her today, but actually this problem's cropped up. Can you see her? Or they may just ask my advice and support for someone they're seeing and I can give them some instructions. So a consultant is a critical part of the team, but doesn't have to see every single woman. Um, we can delegate and share out tasks depending on what the relevant expertise is. And this works with a number of teams that I work with, um, not just the perinatal mental health team. The other key team that I am part of is the home birth team. What does an obstetrician have to do with home birth, you might say? Home birth is uncomplicated pregnancy and birth at home, it's nothing to do with an obstetrician. But actually being the support behind the scenes, being there when a woman perhaps develops a complication or even just a slight deviation 
or change in her risk factors that means maybe she needs a little bit of obstetric input. Um, sometimes the midwives will email me or contact me or the woman will come and see me for an appointment for us to discuss is home birth still a sensible option? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't strictly speaking according to guidance, but balancing up the risks and discussing things together, we can come up with an approach that's individualized for that woman. Maybe it means having a bit of extra treatment available at home or explaining to her she's got a slightly higher chance of being transferred in in labor. So there's a lot one can do as a consultant to support the midwives, the home birth team midwives, and a lot of those women having a home birth I will never see, but I'm there if something crops up. And it's important to have that relationship of trust. So I've worked with the team for a long time. I know the midwives are extremely experienced in home birth. So when I'm talking to a woman about the chance of complications or problems at home, I'm very confident that I know that that team are very experienced and I will tell her if the team say that you need to come in then you need to come in you will need to be transferred and you need to listen to that team because they're very competent someone had their hand up just from Linda you tell her the advantages of home birth too oh absolutely yes so um I, I, and and often, so a lot of the women that are asking for something that's a little bit more um, out of guidance, shall we say, um, I will often say to them, actually, yes, I, I think you're quite right, um, that home birth actually could be a really good option for you. For example, um, I wouldn't necessarily encourage a vaginal birth after cesarean at home, but actually for some of the women that have had intervention, and you think they didn't have an obstructed labor um there isn't a reason maybe they've had a cesarean for breech birth uh, for for breech presentation then actually if they go into spontaneous labor being away from us doctors could actually increase their chance of a successful v-back so you know it's about balancing up the risks because we know that the outcomes are better for midwifery led care um, and home birth. And because I've got that trust with the team and I know they're used to doing um, home vaginal birth after cesarean, I know that if anything starts to deviate from normal, that they're going to recommend the woman comes in and have a low threshold. So I can say, yes, I can't officially recommend this, but I can understand the pros and cons and why. And yes, there could be some benefits of this. And the same with perhaps a woman who's got a normally grown baby, but she's gestational diabetes, but well controlled on diet. Officially, she's she shouldn't be having a home birth, but actually we can have a rational conversation about, okay, well, what are the risks if your baby's not macrosomic and your blood sugar control is good and your labor starts spontaneously? So, um, we can have sensible conversations because yes, there's, there's a lot of benefit. So I want to think a little bit about hierarchy now. Um, so I showed that slide with the midwife at the bottom and the doctor at the top and this idea of hierarchy. Um, and that's really important within relationships, um, how flat or I uh, guess high would be the opposite, is the hierarchy. So I want you to just um, take this poll now and tell me how easy you feel it is to raise questions or concerns at work. So um, I don't know if you're aware of the Each Baby Counts work from the RCOG. And one of the things they looked at was the fact that when there's a CTG concern, how easy is it for people to escalate and can they escalate clearly? 
Um, and a lot of problems come about with decision making because people don't escalate or feel apprehensive about escalating. And this is a really important safety question. Going back to what I said about getting to know your team, if you know your team, then you're much more likely to feel safe letting the midwife in charge know or letting the doctor know that you're worried about things. So I'm interested to see here that there's a bit of a mixture and that actually a third of people uh, on the call are feeling sometimes they feel a bit apprehensive about raising concerns. Um, and that is a worry. Um, and it's difficult to get a good culture where it's very easy to escalate. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the some of the things that may make that easier. So one example is what we've done with fetal monitoring training. So as I mentioned, fetal heart monitoring can be a, a big issue in terms of escalation and, and risk of action not being taken or people not feeling happy to escalate. And at my trust, we are all educated to the same level. So we all, midwives, junior doctors, consultants, senior team, we all do the identical fetal monitoring training. I do apologize, my dog has just arrived. Um, we all do the same fetal monitoring training. We're all identically trained. We all go to the same masterclass once a year, three or four hours of mandatory training. We all take a competency assessment. Um, we all do the same one. We're all marked in the same way. And therefore we have a common language and shared understanding. And everyone can recognize an act. So rather than the old system where it might be that the junior midwife in the room would escalate to the midwife in charge and then she might tell one of the junior doctors and then the junior doctor might um, tell the, the consultant and then a decision might be made. Everyone has the same understanding. So I can have a midwife come and say to me, Florence, there's a chronic hypoxia. There's a lady with chronic hypoxia or Florence, there's a lady with subacute hypoxia on her CTG. And I, I don't need to go and check. I mean, obviously I will go and see the woman, so I will check. But I immediately know what I need to do. And that midwife will immediately tell me, this woman needs delivery. This woman, um, this baby's in trouble. So that need for escalation is taken away because everybody's on the same level. Everyone's got a shared understanding and everyone's view is respected. I've also started, as Ali mentioned in her introduction, doing a joint clinic. So doing a joint clinic with my consultant midwife colleague, we found that a lot of women who were slightly um, having alternative care plans were having to come and see her and then come and see myself. And there was a lot of duplication of appointments and it wasn't very helpful. Um, and we decided to bring things together so that we see the woman usually once and then we can have some email back and forth um, or I might follow her up if needed but we will then make a written care plan that we'll share with her via email it'll go on our computer system at the hospital so that everyone is aware um, of what the care is that we're hoping to provide but it just means that we're not giving inconsistent advice. It isn't that the midwives are saying one thing and the doctors are saying another thing and the paediatricians are saying another thing. We can just bring everything um, together into one appointment and that's been really helpful. Um, and recently it was just so lovely to receive this feedback from a woman um, and, and hear how much she felt that having that joint appointment had really helped her. Then I wanted to talk a bit about leadership. So 
I want to know where you're working and it's interesting we've got lots of people from the states because I think my understanding is a lot of women give birth in lithotomy in the states so um, let's take this poll how do most women giving birth vaginally so this is excluding cesareans uh, give birth in what position Just giving a bit of a time warning, Florence, it's 22, so we've got about five, ten minutes. Okay, I'm going too questions. slowly, aren't I? Okay, okay it's a good in case. That, <laughs> in that case, I'm going to publish this poll. That's not as bad as I thought it was going to be, actually. Um, so um, we've got 50% in whatever position they want. Yay! So in this country, it's around 20 to 25%, depending on the year, that give birth in in lithotomy regardless of whether it's an assisted vaginal birth which is really quite worrying um, and this led me to do the lithotomy challenge uh, which was trying to put myself in that woman's position um, because I as I mentioned I'd had emergency cesarean so I wanted to understand what it was like in lithotomy and I did a lithotomy challenge for NHS change day and if you look on Twitter at hashtag lithotomy challenge you'll find lots of different people have followed suit and done really interesting reflections with their teams on what it feels like how vulnerable and exposed you feel even though i was wearing clothes so building understanding of what it's like as that woman um, as people come in and out of the door or come and talk to you between your legs um, what that actually feels like and and how difficult that is and I've done this with student midwives and I've done this with um, midwives and I've done it with doctors and our practice development midwives do it with all our new starters now so that they get from the beginning um, that feeling and also sense of, okay, if I put a sheet and cover her up and give her a bit more, bit less exposure, a bit more modesty, that makes a small difference. If I put her in lithotomy for the minimum possible time, that makes a small difference. Um, and this week I've been really gratified to see um, some people doing the lithotomy challenge um, in Southampton, Isle of Wight and today apparently Surrey for Maternal Mental Health Awareness Week. It's also important uh, how you role model and I try and role model quite a personalised caesarean experience so giving the baby direct to mum if baby can come on your chest with a vaginal birth why can't it for a cesarean birth you can just pass the baby across the drape for skin to skin with the umbilical cord intact um, while you're waiting for uh, optimal cord clamping of course with the uterus open I can't leave the um, umbilical cord waiting for white sadly although sometimes I can because sometimes the whole placenta um, is delivered and I can pass baby placenta the whole shebang to the midwife um, to sort out um, I put on here about different anesthetics because I've also had issues where both parents um, are excluded from the birth of their child because the woman is having a general anesthetic we don't generally have partners in theatre at that point and I have on occasion managed to bring the partner into theatre to see the baby born um, even though the woman is under a general anaesthetic because why should that baby arrive completely surrounded by strangers? How good are you at discussing names or do you talk about women as diagnoses? So we've got people mostly using a woman's name which is great you know, some of us get into bad habits and I do it myself sometimes where it's the placenta previa or room 24 and that's really bad. We need to remember these are women, these are human beings and I usually on the ward round go into a room and say, hello, my name's Florence and I will say, hello, Letitia, hello, Ali whatever their name is, address them by name and it helps implant them in my mind as that person, as a specific person um, rather than a diagnosis or um, just a number or a room. 
And it's the same with the staff. It's important to consider that your fellow staff, you know, are not just, we have a real bad habit of talking about the ped, as in the paediatrician, rather than using their name. They're people and they, they deserve to be known by name. Language is really important. I mentioned my births were failure to progress. Um, the use of failure um, is, is very negative for women. Um, and also using language women can't understand, like IOL, that means induction of labor to me, but to an ophthalmologist means intraocular lens. So not only can it cause confusion, but women don't understand what we're talking about. So we need to be transparent and clear with the language we use. Knowledge is power. So it's really important to give women good information if we're going to hope to give them good women-centered care. And we're very much um, trying to treat women autonomously. We're moving away from this paternalistic idea of medicine where I tell you what you should do because I'm the doctor. I give you information on which you can then make your decision is the way forward. So um, that's why I, I started my podcast and it was partly for maternity staff to try and help them understand the things that I'm thinking about, but also to try and get my thoughts out to pregnant women. And um, often the midwives will recommend to a woman a particular episode related to whatever problem they have in pregnancy. And I try and signpost to nice guidance or RCOG guidance so that there's some good quality information. Because let's face it, these days women, they may use the internet, they look stuff up. So at least then they get some good standardized quality. But also I try and be open and honest and discuss the fact that some things we're not very clear what the evidence is. We're making recommendations, but how good quality is that evidence? So um, to bring it to an end, and I'm sorry for rushing through things a little bit, I think what I'd like to leave you with is that anyone can make a difference. These are just my thoughts and ideas. There are little things that you might be able to change in your day-to-day -day work um, with the team that you work with that might help you collaborate a bit better with the rest of your team or work with your obstetricians or anaesthetists or fellow midwives. Um, so there are little things that each and every one of us can do that don't cost anything, using a woman's name and introducing yourself properly or thinking about minimizing the time in lithotomy or having a coffee with one of the team it doesn't cost anything, but it may improve things, improve your teamwork, improve your culture and ultimately improve things for the women and babies under your care. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Um, I'm sure you've inspired a lot of us to build that relationship in our team with the neonatal doctors, the obstetricians, the midwives, the team leaders, and really have that openness and um, mutual respect of each other. There's lots of um, agreement in the chat regarding some of your suggestions. Every maternity unit needs a Florence. Can you clone yourself, Florence? <laughs> Um, and an amazing um, comment actually from Letitia where every woman, every woman in Ghana gives birth in lithotomy and Linda who was a midwife in um, England and lives in Scotland now who has never seen a woman giving birth in lithotomy which um, astounds me Linda, that's amazing. I don't know if anybody does have any questions, we are running very short of time. Um, our master facilitator Halima has already pasted some links but I'm just going to repeat them there again and I'm just going to grab presenter just to remind myself um, oh you've got some links sorry, here as well quick, Florence, sorry <laughs> yeah just a quick one Florence yes everything we are discussing is how to improve the experience of the woman's birth 
But in other parts of the world, for example, where I am, we are still holding on to making sure that every woman goes home safe. So that yes. is where our emphasis on is on. Our emphasis is not on how the how we write a good story about the woman's experience. Even in the classrooms, the way we teach students and all that, and not yes. emphasizing on um, the birthing experience, how nice it was, and all those things. Yes. So in an era like this, where we are promoting writing a good birth experience, how do we incorporate this into our old primitive ways of doing things? Yes, so this is a, a common thing in terms of people thinking that we just need to focus on the safety. And when I started doing this work, people were saying, no, 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 that's just fluff. We need to focus on the safety. But there's a lot of correlation between safety and experience. So um, listening to women, really listening to them and understanding what they're telling you and uh, what is happening to them is critical for safety um, and communicating with them properly is crucial for safety. So I think sometimes people think, well, we have to do the safety first, but actually the, the two come together. So a woman being able to raise concerns, a woman being able to tell you what she's feeling and then for her to be listened to um, and not, you know, women talk about not being believed um, in the UK, and, and I can't imagine that that's necessarily different in other parts of the world. Um, so people not listening, not not believing them when they talk about what symptoms, or their baby's not moving, or they've bled, and people saying, well, it wasn't that much, or whatever. So um, I think my advice would be, communication and listening is a critical component of that safety. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, I think it's fine. That's fine. Thank you, Florence. I think we all need more, more time with you um, because we haven't had much for questions and I think there's a thirst for that, but um, I'm sure people can head to your uh, OBS pod and, and get some more insights into the work that, that you do. Um, and a big, big thank you from the VIDM for presenting today. I'm